Welcome to MICE Tech Talk with the Technical Information Scientists of the Jackson Laboratory. My name is Dr. Janine, and my job as a Technical Information Scientist is to serve the research community, you guys, by answering all of your mouse-related research questions. And I am Dr. Ito. My Tech Talk is a way for us to connect with the research community and answer some of the most related questions live. All right, well, hopefully you've got your coffee and you're ready to ask any of your questions because it's time for Mice Tech Talk. So today, let's talk mouse health on arrival. Yeah, and as we all know that animal welfare is a very important topic, and it's it also my favorite ones. Um, here at JAX, we are committed to offer you the healthiest animal as possible when it arrives at your facility. So today we are going to help you with some guidelines on the most common health issues that you may see and tips on helping the mice acclimate to the new environment as soon as possible. Great. So we've uh, prepared a few discussion topics, but if you're watching live, which I see many of you are, you can use the comment section of the video that you're watching from and let us know where you're viewing from and any health or uh, animal health related questions that you might have. So we'll try to answer those today live. So Yitong, um, you actually have a unique role on our TIS team in that um, most of the people in our team were bench trained scientists or trying to do research and then transitioned over to TIS. But your background is definitely um, very different and you spend time with our clinical veterinarian team at JAX. Um, how has that shaped how you interact with our research customers? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, my role is a bit unique compared to other TI's colleagues because my background is all veterinary medicine and preventive veterinary medicine. So I go to the mouse room a um, couple of times a week to check the mice that are already on observation or when there is any um, new health issues comes up. So by doing that, I think I have a better understanding on mouse related health concerns when talking with researchers. And I totally understand the significant impact of animal health on your study readouts. So we really need to make sure that we are doing the right thing for the mice when first arrived at your facility. Yeah, I think that's pretty important. I think as a bench scientist, I definitely didn't consider how important mouse health is on how uh, it can affect my research results. I kind of took for granted they're just mice. They're they're what I'm I'm using for my experiments. But the you've really brought an important perspective to our team in having some training in animal health uh, and welfare. So uh, if someone has ordered mice and they know what day the mice are supposed to show up in their facilities, what should they do after they arrive, after those mice arrive in their facility? Yeah, I think the first thing that they should do is just to observe through the observation window on the shipping container. So like each shipping container, we have two observation window on each part of it. So you can just look through it to see how those mice behave. Um, and when you are doing that, please do not tilt or shake the shipping container. Um, if you see those mice that are not behaving well, like they are fighting, please unpack them immediately after arrival and following your research guidelines. Um, and if you see something um, abnormal, please alert your facility vet um, to seek care of affected mice and also let us know. Um, if the mice that you see, they are not fighting, they are doing well, they are looking around, they are just grumbling. Um, so this is something that people may not be aware of is that you do not need to unpack them immediately after arrival. Um, the food, the hydrogel in the shipping container is more than sufficient to offer the mice that we shipped for seven to 10 days in transit. So it is okay and preferable to unpack the mice the first thing next morning, which could help them settle down. And again, this is assuming that this is accepted by your facility guide. Um, by doing that, you could detect any abnormalities when the mice were unpacked into a new cage, which is considered a new environment for them. Uh, whereas if you um, um, receive the mice in the afternoon and unpack them in the late afternoon, the technicians are not working at night. So you may miss um, detecting some of the abnormalities that the, those, um, the, those mice um, were unpacked into a new environment. And the second important thing that I really need to emphasize is when you do unpack, 
please do not combine the mice in different shipping container and in different compartment, which would cause aggression and fighting. The mice shipped out in our facility is never combined if they are not housed together in our facility. And the third point that I would highly encourage you to do is to watch closely for the first couple of days when the mice arrived. As we all know that shipping is very stressful, so you really need to pay more attention to the mice for the first couple of days when they arrive, just by looking through their cages, not pulling them up um, to handle them, observe them, um, give them a couple of days for them to get used to the cage, food and water, um, and if you detect anything abnormal, please let us know and let your facility vet know as soon as possible. Great. So that was definitely something new to me that I didn't know that you can actually wait to unpack the mice a day as long as they're not fighting, of course, and as long as it's uh, approved by your facility. Um, you mentioned this last point here about looking for anything abnormal in the days after mice arrive. Um, what would be considered abnormal that someone should look out for? Yeah, so that's something that you may need to know is what is normal for your strain and what is not. So generally something abnormal would be uh, myeloclusion. So it means that the incisor teeth that grows into the palate or out of the mouth make the mice hard to drink and eat. Um, eye issues um, like small eye, no eye or cloudy eye. Um, hydrocephalus, um, where the fluid could build up in the ventricles of the brain and appear as a dome shape. Um, skin problems could be as light as just alopecia, um, hearing loss, um, or it could progress to dermatitis or ulcerative dermatitis. And of course, lethargy, hunched posture, ruffled hair, and also dehydration. Um, and I really need to emphasize that whenever there is health issues, the facility veterinarian should be alert and involved. You could certainly call us to see if this is something that we see in our facility, but the best, best person to help you would be your facility vet. Okay, yeah, and you mentioned dehydration. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about that because I, I recall from many of my conversations that dehydration is probably one of the most common things that we hear about from researchers. And this usually happens within about a week after the mice arrive in your facility. And it's completely treatable um, and it's something that's uh, relatively easy for you to assess. Um, and one thing I wanted to um, mention was that uh, the mice at Jack's are raised on water bottles. So in our facility, what we do is we take our water and it uh, is dispensed into water bottles that we can then autoclave um, before the, they enter into our barrier rooms that allows us to keep a high health status. Um, so if your mouse facility happens to use a different watering system, like an automated watering system, the mice might need some hydration assistance in learning how to transition from uh, a water bottle to kind of an automated, maybe like a Lixit system. Um, and I know that your facility veterinarians probably have ways to help train the mice and, and helping them either learn to use that new water source or also help them uh, mice with hydration assistance during that transition. So um, Yitong, what does a dehydrated mouse look like and how do you determine that? Yeah, so it's a very um, simple way to detect whether the mice are dehydrated or not. So usually we will just pinch the skin over the shoulder area of the mice. Um, in a well hydrated mice, the skin will return to its normal shape like within three seconds. And if, it, and if the skin remains bunched up, um, which is an indication of dehydration. And I'm just going to share with you a very easy tip to avoid dehydration is to give hydro gel for the first couple of days when the mice arrived. You could certainly use the gel pack in the shipping container when transfer the mice, or you could, if your facility do have a supply of a hydro gel, feel free to use those. Yeah, so hydrogel is like that little kind of jelly stuff, right, where the mice, it's like on the ground where the mice can actually like, like eat into it where they don't have to reach up. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so that, that probably makes it a little bit easier for them to access that type of hydration as well. Um, okay, so we know some abnormal things like dehydration and malocclusion and uh, things like that that you just described. What would be considered normal or might be considered normal? Yeah, something normal would, could depend on the strain. So we usually refers to a strain characteristic. Um, and 
it is very important to know the model that you are working with before receiving the mice. So you know that what kind of phenotype that they may develop and you know what to expect. Okay, yep, let me show you guys. Um, actually, Yitong chose this model for us over here. I'm gonna open up my browser over here on the right side and it might be kind of tiny for you guys to see it. Um, but we opened up a strain called NOX3 um, and the mutation is called HET-3J and that's just the mutant allele. Um, the, the mutant allele was actually named for the phenotype that's very obvious, which is called head tilt three. So there were a lot of different head tilt phenotypes. But I wanted to show you on the data sheet where you can go and find more of that information for maybe things that aren't quite so obvious. Um, so you would go to this section here called disease and phenotype, and then down to mammalian phenotype terms by genotype. And if you go there, what happens is you get to a section where you can actually open it up. You'll notice here that the genotype being described here is homozygous. You'll also realize here that the genetic background of this particular mutation is listed here. So it's a mixed 129 and um, black six um, background. And if you go into that section, um, scientific curators have actually read these papers and then um, assigned very specific vocabulary to the t types of uh, phenotypes that are uh, exist or that were observed in this strain. So for example, this particular strain has an abnormal postural reflex and then of course, as we mentioned, a head tilt. And then you can go to the um, publication in which this was um, described and see all of that information in context. So I think this is a pretty valuable um, section of the data sheet to understand what would be normal and maybe abnormal, or at least what has been published about your strain. Okay, so um, with regards to head tilt, like that's normal for this strain, but Yitong, um, it's probably not normal for other strains, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I do aware of that some of the causes that could cause the head tilt, which include um, otitis. Um, that could happen in any strain, and usually it is associated with inflammation within the inner or outer ear. And it also could due to chronic polyarthritis, especially in black six mice. And it may also due to like um, autoimmune disease, neoplasia, just tumors, or congenital conditions. Yeah, so I, I can imagine that would be pretty problematic in a strain that's not supposed to have a head tilt. <laughs> it's all these other potential um, other health issues that your facility veterinarian should be made aware of um, and that can help you um, to treat the treat or diagnose like what could be going on. Mm -hmm. um, we did actually get a question here from, uh, it's either YouTube or LinkedIn, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, the question is, what is your recommendation for an acclimation period after arrival to when the mice can be used for a study? Uh, Yitong, what would you say for that? Yeah, um, that's actually a very great point and it leads to our um, discussion. So uh, I read a number of studies that have shown that animal experience various degree of stress as a result of transport and it takes some time for them to return to the normal physiological state. Um, eating, drinking, and growth um, tend to return to normal levels in about a week after delivery to the new location. And some subtle physiological and immunological changes may last longer. So I think that at least one week um, is a acclimation period uh, for the mice that would be good for a study. Yeah, I think it also depends a lot on the type of study that you're running. I'm thinking of a publication that I'll probably link in the comments later uh, that I've just realized um, about how long it takes for different um, different uh, aspects of the physiology to return to normal. Um, I would say like a week is usually kind of like a good ballpark kind of rule of thumb um, acclimation period. But again, it's going to depend very specifically on the exact thing that you're researching. Um, I know that for some of our diet induced obesity strains or the obese strains, sometimes two weeks is actually preferable. There are some strains where if you handle the mice too often, even just like changing cages and things like that, that can be stressful enough for them to not want to um, eat um, and also causes them to like start losing weight. Um, so I think it's very dependent on the mouse strain in particular um, and the type of research that you're doing. Um, and I, I would say probably microbiome is probably one of the most challenging ones to kind of think about. And as you said, immunological changes, I think those can be um, pretty long lasting changes. And so we'll try and link some of those publications in the comments later today. 
Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions, and I think that's basically to the end of our presentation. Um, I did want to say that uh, oh, go, one comment I forgot to mention was that uh, because shipping is so stressful, you know, we want to have that period of time to have the mice acclimate to their new facility, um, not just for their own stress levels, but also for your research question, because I can imagine a stressed mouse is not going to be um, able to respond as robustly as one that is not stressed, for example. Um, okay, so that's all the time we have for this week. Uh, we do have a few resources that we already linked in the video description, different than the publication that I was talking about. And uh, Yitong, do you want to quickly go over what those two uh, links are? Yeah, um, so the first one is our general animal health program. So it includes information about our health reports, um, list of pathogens that we are monitoring, and also detailed information about our different barrier levels. And the second resource is, is our shipping container. So we also reference some of the information in this my tech talk. And um, feel free to poke through those resources. And if you have any other questions, please call us or email us at mastech at jax.org. And we are happy to address any questions you have. I'm going to send all those questions to you, Yitong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, thanks everybody for attending today. Our next Mice Tech Talk is called Let's Talk Cree Locks, very popular uh, topic, Cree Locks next week, which is going to be Tuesday, August 18th. We look forward to seeing you guys on LinkedIn, YouTube that time. And uh, just as Janine and Yitong signing off and saying, stay healthy, stay safe, and stay excited about research. Bye guys.